Um, how do we solve these types of constrained optimization problems? Is like I said, this is the method of Lagrange multipliers. So suppose you want to find either the maximum or the minimum of a function. We're going to name our function f when we're trying to find the maximum or minimum. That function we're trying to optimize is f. And we want to have all of our independent variables subject to a system of constraint equations. Um, and so my system of constraint equations, I'm going to name G. And so the first constraint equation, I would say G1 equals 0. The second constraint equation, I would say G2 equals 0. The third constraint equation, I would say G3 equals 0, and so on, right? I'm using the subscript to number my constraint equations and label them. So what, what does it mean to say uh, lambda k times g k? Is it for every single equation? Or? Yep, that's a good question. So you know the capital sigma means this is the sum, like I'm adding all of them up. The GKs is just saying that K is going to take on all the natural number values, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., for all the uh, constraint equations. Um, lambda. Lambda is a scalar that we're going to call a Lagrange multiplier. That's how we get the name, the method of Lagrange multipliers. And there is going to be a Lagrange multiplier one for every constraint equation. And so if I had three constraint equations, G1, G2, G3, then I would have three Lagrange multipliers, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. So what this sum is doing is it's adding up the product of the Lagrange multiplier that corresponds to each constraint equation. So Let's say I have three constraint equations, then the Lagrange function is equal to f, the function I'm trying to optimize, plus lambda 1 times g1, plus lambda 2 times g2, plus lambda 3 times g3. Okay. So that's the first step, is we're going to figure out what is our Lagrange function. Like when you're working your project this semester, you're going to have to figure out the first thing. Step number one, what is my Lagrange function? Step number two is we're going to find the critical points of the Lagrange function. So you would take the gradient of the Lagrange function, which is the partial derivative of that function with respect to x and y and z and all of your independent variables, and with respect to the Lagrange multipliers. So you'll take the derivative, the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to lambda 1, with respect to lambda 2, with respect to lambda 3. And then setting all of those equal to 0 is going to give you a system of equations. just have to solve the system of equations. And now you're going to know exactly where your minimum or maximum is with respect to your constraints. Now, even if you have found like a minimum or a maximum of your function f in terms of your variables x, y, and z, like you've actually found the maximum or minimum value of f with respect to your constraints, you would probably still expect that the critical point of the Lagrange function you just found is going to be a saddle point. And the reason for that is because you've introduced these Lagrange multipliers and those might be introducing some positive or negative eigenvalues and you don't really have control over those. You don't really have control over what your Lagrange multipliers are doing with this method. You don't know if they're going to be positive or negative is what I'm trying to say. So rather than trying to characterize critical points, which would be a nightmare anyways, uh, what you would do is you would just rely on your knowledge of the problem. Like if you just happen to know that your problem is set up in such a way that the only critical point would be a minimum, then you have a minimum. Um, alternatively, if you find multiple critical points, you could just plug in those values into your f function and then evaluate your f function at all those points. And then you know the highest value of the f function would be the maximum and the lowest would be the minimum. And then you could just call it a day. So we're not going to do any sort of fancy, crazy classifying 
Instead, we're just going to use our common sense, or we're going to use our function to just evaluate the points. So, uh, are we assuming that uh, uh, Apple can have, have the same critical points? They should not have the same critical points. Have. Nope. I mean, I mean, they could. Like, you could find cases where they do, but in general, no. Curiosity question: Is this really used a lot in microeconomics? In economics? Micro. Probably. Yeah, because probably thinks of some economics problems where you'd use this. Yeah, because it sounds very familiar for some reason. Okay, so. This is the procedure, right? You define your Lagrange function, and then you set the gradient of the Lagrange function equal to zero. I want to try to explain to you like why this would work. So it's, it wasn't obvious to me the first time I heard about it why it should work. You know, I used the little formulas and I got the right answers, and I said, okay, you know, good job. But like, why did I do that? Why do we define the Lagrange function the way that we do, and why do we try to take the gradient? You know, so. One thing I think is really easy to explain, and if we take the case where f is just a function of two variables and there's only one constraint equation, I'll just call it g, but there's only one constraint equation, um, then my Lagrange function would be this. It would just be a function of three variables, x, y, and lambda, where I've got my function f that I'm trying to optimize, plus lambda, my Lagrange multiplier, times the expression g that fits inside my constraint equation, g equals zero. Okay, so now if I take the gradient of my Lagrange function and I set it equal to zero, this creates a system of three equations. The first equation is setting that partial derivative with respect to x equal to zero. The second equation is setting the partial derivative with respect to y equal to zero. And then the third equation would be setting the partial derivative with respect to lambda equal to zero. Now the easiest thing to explain, I think it's harder from here, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful that this is easy to explain. What is the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to lambda? Yeah, it's just g. And so this part says that g is equal to 0. So setting the gradient of the Lagrange function equal to 0 guarantees that my constraint is respected. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's easy to understand. Like, yeah, our solution, we want our constraint to be respected. And so that pops out as part of this gradient here. That's not the full story, though. Um, like the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to x would then be the partial derivative of f with respect to x plus lambda times the partial derivative of g with respect to x. And then of course this partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to y would be like the same thing but with y's. If I were just trying to find the maximum or minimum of f without caring about my constraint equation, like if I didn't, if I wasn't stuck trying to respect my constraint equation, what I would be doing is I would be setting the gradient of f equal to zero. And I would only care about these partial derivatives. But instead, since I want to obey my constraint equation, I'm having to tack on this plus lambda partial g partial x and plus lambda partial g partial y. And so this is the part that's kind of difficult to understand, is how does adding these terms cause me to find the exact point that I want to find, right? The point that maximizes or minimizes f while still uh, obeying my constraint equation. So to try to illustrate this to you, I'm going to give you this example, where f is a function of two variables. Specifically, f is x squared minus y squared. And to visualize this, you could think of this as a surface, z equals x squared minus y squared. It's an explicit surface in 3D space. 
but we want to find this subject to this constraint equation, okay? And so if this is my constraint equation, it defines a relation between my two independent variables, x and y. I'm saying, you know, probably the true minimum or the true maximum of this f function, if I found that, if I found a coordinate pair x and y that gives me a maximum or a minimum of this function, it's probably not going to satisfy this equation. So instead, give me the best coordinate pair x and y that both satisfies this equation and gives me the maximum or minimum value of f on this constraint curve. So this is not yet in the right form because what I want is g of x and y equal to 0. But this is equal to 1. And so what I would need to do here to this equation is I would need to subtract 1 from both sides. Now the right side is equal to 0. And if you think about it, you can always do this with any equation. You just have to uh, take one side of the equation, subtract it from the other side of the equation, and then you always have one side of your equation equals 0. So however your constraint equation is given to you, you do have to rearrange it so that the right side of the equation is 0. And then that means that this whole left side of the equation, this is what I mean by g of x and y. So the expression or the function g of x and y, that is the left side of your constraint equation after you set the right side equal to 0. OK, so now if I were to follow my procedure, my Lagrange function is a function of x, y, and lambda. So the first thing I do is write f of x and y. And then the next thing I do is say plus lambda g of x and y. And so I could write the Lagrange function is equal to uh, x squared minus y squared, because that's the f part, plus lambda times 2x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1.1 squared minus 1, close parentheses. That's my Lagrange function. Now you guys know how to take gradients, you know how to take partial derivatives, and so you just have to set gradient L equal to 0. That gives you a system of three equations. You just got to solve that system of three equations, and then you'd be good. <coughs> so visually, let me show you what this means visually starting with my arch nemesis. <laughs> and then, so if I set z equal to x squared minus y squared, of course, this is the you know, easy saddle point example. So there's really no maximum or minimum value of this function. If I were to constrain this to a certain constraint equation, then uh, you could see where the maximum or minimum values might occur. So my constraint equation is uh, 2x minus 2 squared plus I think y minus 1.1 squared mm, equals 1. And so this is why I was getting really mad at this morning is I, I would really like to show you the intersection of these two surfaces Right, the big potato chip is my function f, and then this little ellipse is my constraint equation between variables x and y. And so the only possible solutions to this optimization problem would lie on the intersection between that elliptical cylinder and the um, hyperboloid that you see there. Then if you wanted to find the maximum with respect to the constraints, you would look at the intersection of those two surfaces and you'd find the value that has the highest z coordinate. And if you wanted to find the minimum with respect to the constraint equations, then you would look at the intersection of those two surfaces and you'd find the point that has the lowest z value. Like I said, I tried for a long time to try to plot just the intersection of these two surfaces. And if GeoGebra worked like it was advertised, I should be able to type in the word intersect f comma eq1 
and then hit enter and it would plot it but instead it just gives me this question mark and that's why I was like so angry today as I was like come on just show me the intersection I don't know what's so hard about this but uh, I don't know maybe that makes it more clear can you just kind of see where it intersects that would be that would be the solution to our, our problem right there is the maximum point in the intersection of these two surfaces and then the solution to the minimum constrained problem would be that point with the lowest z value at the intersection okay so that's the 3d view um, a lot of sources I think including your textbook in this section um, give up on the 3d view and they just try to uh, show you what's happening in two dimensions which is good as well so let me try to give you my best shot at this in two dimensions okay what is the name of this what am I trying to show you that's a topographical map or you could call it a contour map this is like a contour map of the hyperboloid. This is the contour map of my function f, right? So remember, it's kind of like a saddle point where it gets flat in the middle around the origin, and then up here and down here, it's actually like scooping down low. And then over here to the left and over here to the right, it actually is getting really large. So like the z-axis would be pointing towards you, and the negative z-axis would be going into the board. Um, and so that's how you kind of imagine this contour map. This purple curve represents my constraint equation. So what I'm saying is, tell me about the maximum of this green function and the minimum of this green function as your x and y coordinates have to belong to this purple set. Like you can't just take any point x and y, you have to take points that belong to this purple ellipse. And so the minimum value is going to be over here because, you know, the value of my function f decreases with increasing y value. It was like minus y squared, I think. And so this point right here, kind of over here, this is probably the minimum values of my f function. And I think I've got a neat little... Is it going to work? Yeah, okay, perfect. So now I've got a little level set that I can move around. Right? And so let me uh, make it just so that the purple curve and this new green level set intersect, but only at like one point. Do you see that? How this purple curve intersects this level set at just one point? So the point where this constraint equation, purple curve, intersects my green level set of my f function that's going to be the minimum value of my f function with respect to this constraint. Because if it were any other point along my purple curve, then it has to have a higher value, right? These level sets are telling me about the values of my function, and if I'm anywhere in this direction, I'm going to have a higher value of f. Okay, so that point is uh, the minimum of this uh, constraint optimization problem. Now what's special about that point is that here the purple curve and the green curve are parallel to each other. They're like tangent to each other because they intersect but just at one point and they're parallel to each other at that point. If the purple and the green are parallel to each other that also means that their normal vectors are parallel to each other, right? Okay. So if their tangent vectors are parallel, that means their normal vectors are parallel. And the normal vector of a level curve is what? The gradient, the gradient. yeah. And, and so this would be the negative gradient. Um, actually, I should draw like this. This is the gradient of f. OK. And then what about the purple curve? Well, if I think about the purple curve as being a level set of that g function, 
then the gradient of the g function is also the normal vector of this purple curve. And so you can think about um, this as being the gradient of g. So I need the gradient of f and I need the gradient of g to be vectors that are parallel to each other. What it means to be parallel as vectors is like you don't really care about the relative size of the vectors. You could have a really large vector and a really tiny vector and as long as they're pointing in the same direction they're parallel. But you don't care about the size. And so what we need, I should be, <laughs> I should be drawing on this just for the sake of the recording. But, um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, very good. So what I need is f, sorry, the gradient of f to be parallel to the gradient of g. And since I don't care about their s relative size, I only care that they're in the same direction, that just means that the gradient of f has to be some scalar multiple of the gradient of g. And that means that the gradient of f minus a scalar multiple of the gradient of g is equal to zero but I don't care if the scalar multiple is positive or negative, so you could write a minus sign or a plus sign here, and it's not going to matter. And it turns out, if I just arbitrarily say that that's positive, you could do negative, and this whole process still works, by the way. That scalar multiple is what we call a Lagrange multiplier. Okay? So... Back to here, why do we have, up in the top right of this page, why do I have the gradient of f, with respect to you know, x and y, partial derivatives, plus the Lagrange multiplier times the gradient of g? This is guaranteeing that those gradient vectors are parallel to each other. If the gradient vectors are parallel and the tangent vectors are parallel, and that means the curves are tangent to each other, and that means you found the minimum or the maximum of your function with respect to your constraint equation. So it's hard to explain, but I think that like once you get it, you're like, oh, wow, that's actually really cool. That's really clever. So um, mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange, I think, figured this out when he was 19 years old in a you know, the first time this was published in a paper was um, when he was 19 years old. And so that means uh, it was in like 1755 or something like that. Anyways, so pretty impressive. What were you doing when you were 19 years old? <laughs> you were learning about the method of Lagrange yeah, multipliers. <laughs> okay. So that would probably be the minimum. And then if you wanted to find the maximum, you would go over in the x direction, because I know that my function f is increasing as x increases. And so uh, probably somewhere around here is the maximum value of my f function with respect to this constraint equation, somewhere on this purple curve. And to find that, I just have to find a place where a level curve of f, like this one that I'm moving around, is tangent to the purple curve. So like that point right there, that would be the maximum value in this constraint optimization problem. Yep. What I was trying to show you, um, what I would have shown you in GeoGebra if it worked, is that like, you know, if you laid this elliptical shape on top of the hyperboloid, it would make sort of like a wavy ellipse that in like you know 3d space um, and so then you can more clearly see what these points are but that's okay we'll have to live without it okay so let's um 10 minutes let's try to do an example like what if f is 2x plus y and g, well, let me, uh, let me say that my constraint that I want to respect is x times y equals 32. 
In order to find what g is, I have to rearrange this equation to say x, y minus 32 equals 0. So that way I know that g is the non-zero half of my constraint equation. OK, then to use the method of Lagrange multipliers, I say my Lagrange function is equal to f plus lambda g. So this is going to be 2x plus y times, or sorry, plus, yeah, I think it's plus, lambda times uh, xy minus 32. So I set, I take the gradient of the Lagrange function, I set it equal to 0. That means the partial derivative of my Lagrange function with respect to x is going to be what? Yeah, it'll be 0. But what's the expression for that partial derivative? Two plus lambda y, yep, yeah, thank you. Okay, the partial of lambda with respect to y would be one plus lambda x. And then the partial of the Lagrange with respect to lambda would be, it would just be g, right? So be x, y minus 32. And then I set all of these equal to 0, because I want the gradient to be the 0 vector. And so it gives me a system of three equations with three unknown variables, x, y, and lambda. <clears throat> now, I think what I would do here is take the first equation and then solve for lambda. So I've got lambda equals negative y over 2, no, negative 2 over y. And then I would use this definition of lambda that I got from my first equation and plug it into the second equation. And so the second equation becomes 1 plus negative 2 over y x equals 0. And that means x over y is one half, I think. Or another way I could write this is y equals 2x. So now let's consider the third equation. And I could say x times y is equal to 32. That was my original constraint equation anyways. And then I'll just replace y with 2x. So this says 2x squared is equal to 32, which means x squared is equal to 16, which means that x is 4, which means that y is 8. And so at the point x equals 4, y equals 8, that's where I'm going to find the maximum or maybe the minimum value of my function f with respect to the constraint equation that I had, which was x, y equals 32. So x equals 4, y equals 8. Let's plug that in. So f would be equal to 16. See what this looks like. So we've got the function uh, 2x plus y. And then we had the constraint equation x, y equals 32.
Where is it? The gray part is just the xy plane. Yeah, the blue axis is the z axis. And so, uh, we can try it. We'll do red. Maybe that would show up easier. Oh, I just don't see it. Maybe if I say y equals 32 divided by x. There we go. OK, so that uh, hyperbola is representing my constraint equation. And um, there's not going to be a maximum. There shouldn't be a hmm. So there's not an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum into this problem. Uh, but uh, actually, let me try to make this. Uh, let me let me try to make this a parametric curve. I don't want to really, like really mess it up or anything. But let me try to do x is t. So then y would be thirty two divided by t, and then I want z to be two t plus thirty two over t. Aha, okay. So now what I've done is I've taken my constraint equation and I've plastered it onto my uh, my function f, that plane. So there's not going to be a maximum or a minimum value. Not an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum value, but there is going to be relative maximums and relative minimums, or what you could call them local maximums and local minimums. And those are going to be at the points that are sort of like the minimum of that red curve or the maximum of that little red curve. And so those are going to show up as critical points of our Lagrange function, even though they're not like absolute maximums or minimums. The same way that like the critical points of a single variable function would s still show up as relative maximums or minimums, even if they're not absolute max or mins. Um, so there was two points. There was a relative maximum and a relative minimum. As I was working through this, I was, I guess, working too fast and skipped over the fact that x could also be negative 4, yeah. So if x were negative 4, then y would be negative 8. And that corresponds to the points where f is negative 16. And so this gives you a relative this is actually the relative minimum on that one branch of the hyperbola, and this would be the relative maximum on the other branch of the hyperbola, right? It's an interesting example. I think we've got two minutes left, so we probably don't have enough, enough time to do another one. But try to work some of these. Um, come back tomorrow and tell me what you think. Tell me if you ran into any issues with the practice problems in the book. There's one problem that I want you to work, I want you to pay attention to before tomorrow, and that's number 17 in your textbook. So 17 in your textbook is, is going to give you a function of three variables, x, y, and z, that you want to find the max or minimum to, and it asks you to find the max or minimum with respect to two constraint equations. And so in that case, your Lagrange function would be a function of x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And it would be equal to f, which is a function of x, y, and z, plus lambda 1, g1, plus lambda 2, g2, where g1 and g2 represent two different constraint equations. And that's how you would handle um, question 17. But of course, that means your gradient of your Lagrange function is going to have five entries because you're going to have to take the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to x, y, z, lambda 1, and lambda 2. And set all of those equal to 0. So you'll have a system of five equations that you'll have to work through. Do I have to 
how a, a meaningful like geometric inter interpretation of the for multiple con constraints. Yep. What is the how to, how to like construct the uh, constraints such as we can have a meaningful geometric interpretation? Okay. Do they have to intersect or? So um, both of these constraint equations in this case are going to be uh, functions of three variables, x, y, and z. But we're setting that equal to zero. So we're talking about a level set of a scalar field. So we're talking about a surface in 3D space. And so this is a surface in 3D space, and this is a surface in 3D space. If you want to respect both of these constraint equations, then you're talking about only the set of points that belong to both surfaces. So you're talking about the intersection of those surfaces. Okay. Um, the function itself is a scalar field, and so you're talking about what point on the intersection of those two surfaces gives you the greatest value of the scalar field. I, I, I couldn't like, figure out two separate, isolated, in, independent like, so, uh, level curves like, with a gradient. You know, like, so yes. if, if, these, if these two surfaces never intersected, then there would be no solution. Okay. Yeah, there's only a solution if these curves intersect because that would be the only way you could actually respect both of the constraint equations at the same time. Yeah. Keep going.